two-time national champ, Nebraska Football Hall of Famer, two-time first-team all-conference performer, AP second-team All-American in 1996, Mr. Chris Dishman. How you doing, my friend? Good. How you doing, Adam? I appreciate you joining me. So real quick, I'm curious your thoughts on Trev Albert's departure and who you think might be some good candidates as a potential next AD here at the University of Nebraska. You know, um, that one sprung me by surprise. I mean, I, I, I'm all for, you know, like, if, like Trev leaving and stuff. I, you know, I don't know anything about it other than, you know, it's a, a lateral move for him. But, um, you know, it was a very surprising. Uh, I think he did a great job when he was here. I think all of our departments are, are thriving right now. You know, if you look at our basketball teams, uh, our softball team this year, our girls softball team with getting uh, the girl from Oklahoma. Um, Everything, you know, Matt Rule. I think he's doing a great job there. So you can't fault him for what what happened. You know, like what what he's put on the field. Um, for him transferring, you know, I, it's all hearsay now. We none of us will really know, and probably never will know the story. But uh, you could look at a lot of different things. I mean, he's going to a a, a state with no state income tax. I mean, he's going to make more money. Um, the money there, the Texas. A&M throws at their football program, you know, it's, and Texas football's big. So, I mean, he, he might be in, be able to get a hold of some of that stuff better and get some athletes in there. So, you know, uh, the next guy up, I, I, I don't know who's, you know, good. I mean, Dennis LeBlanc, I, I'm glad to see that he's the intern. Um, he was a great guy when I was there. He's a great guy when you were there. Um, uh, if if he, that's a shot, I mean, I like him there. I mean, I've heard Dave Remington's name thrown around, Brennan Stye's name, Ed Stewart. I mean, these are all people that, you know, I think would be really, you know, good guys that come in that have uh, Nebraska ties, but you, you never know. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, so involved with the program where I know the ins and outs of that, but any one of those guys would be great in my mind. All right. So as Rico and I talked about a minute ago, and most people know, I mean, Every sport has value. Every sport's important. I'm a big fan of all sports. A lot of times, though, athletic directors at major college universities, their their job status tends to be tied to the head football coach. So with that in mind, all right, Mac Rhodes, the current AD at Baylor. Now, he's been there for about a half a decade, done a pretty good job as an overall whole, most people would say. His very first hire as a head football coach was Matt Rule. What are your thoughts on potentially bringing in a guy like Matt Rhodes, knowing that Matt Rule's familiar with him? And as of right now, I mean, until we get some more <laughs> things solidified yeah. around here, Matt Rule's the face of Husker sports as, you know, for, for the moment at least. So what are your thoughts on bringing in a guy like Matt Rhodes, knowing he's familiar with Matt Rule, who is our head football coach? Yeah, true. I mean, yeah, he did uh, the great things. The only thing, you know, he was there with the uh, – the allegations wasn't he there with the allegations with the basketball team though too so yep. that's the only plight against it was he the one there during that time i believe when so Rico, do you mind looking yeah. that up maybe shooting me a text yeah um i wasn't for sure but you know um so i like i said i don't know much about what the, you know i know what the ad is definitely runs high is uh how your football program's doing and i think matt rule's doing building the program the right way that you can in Nebraska, you know, um, with our limited number of transfer port holes, uh, kids going out. I mean, it means the kids like playing for them. They like to stay here. Um, that, that shows, shows a lot, um, especially for the Nebraska faithful fans. Um, but like, I, I don't know much about the guy that brought Matt rule in a Baylor, I know that there was a scandal that the scandal with the basketball thing, but I don't know if that he was even part of it. That's the only thing I know about Baylor. Um, um, so, and like I said, the AD search is going to be, you know, one that the, the board of directors are going to have to hopefully pick the right one. <laughs> yeah, no, that's no problem. Let's chat now about your playing days. Okay. 1994. Mm -hmm. All right part of uh, mm -hmm. one of the original members of the pipeline then you go into 95 mm -hmm. all right i want to go back to that orange bowl night though before we go into the 95 season talk to me your okay. memories of that orange bowl night 
okay, what that meant, Osborne winning his first national title and beating Miami in Miami and what – and that second half, how it really progressed, just wearing that talented Hurricanes defense down and what that was like for you being a part of that team that did that that night. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, something special that night. Um, the, the crazy thing is, is most of the year, that year, you know, we had the pipeline with Wiegert and um, Zadichka and Wilkes and Graham and those guys that all played and Sty. Um, I didn't get much playing time that year because those guys, I know, I just would do just cleanup duty because I was kind of rotating as a second stringer then. And uh, so, you know, during the game, um, you know, I always rotated and we gave breaks out and stuff. But I remember it was early in the first quarter that Coach Tenniper threw me in the game. And I'm like, this is, I've never had like, you know, like when the lights come on, like when the game's on the line, I was never in that situation or that early in my career that all of a sudden we're in a national championship game. And he's like, this is when you got the next series. I'm like, are you kidding me? I haven't done this the whole year. I'm playing Pacific. I haven't done this stuff, you know? <laughs> so I remember going into the game and playing and, uh, I got, uh, uh, got tossed by Warren Sapp because, uh, we were running the counter deuce play where the guard tackle pulls and Brendan was playing on the left side that time. And Graham just stepped to 45 degrees instead of lateral down the line. And Warren Sapp was quick off the ball and he hit me right underneath the ear pad and knocked me over and ripped Lawrence Phillips down the backfield. And I remember getting up and I'm like, this is going to look like crap on film. And I know it's Graham's fault. And I'm like, oh, I need to get out of there quick. I was so ticked off during that play. Um, that's my one memory of the Orange Bowl that uh, I just wish I could have back. But the the crazy thing was, is the way it all, like everybody knows in the scene and what Coach Osborne said in halftime and how he kind of predicted the whole game. And that was, you know, at the time when it was happening, when he was saying that, you know, you're in there, you, you totally believe, you know, what coach is saying and everything all the time. But then now after years and you go back and listen, it's like, holy crap, everything he said kind of came true in that second half. He said, they're going to get a cheap foul here. They're going to get tired. We're going to wear them out. Um, how it all played out was just really, uh, I don't know, iconic, I guess. for and, and it was something that Coach Osborne needed, and we needed to win for him. Um, he went through a lot of stuff, um, you know, saying that he couldn't win the big one, and everybody was on him. But we were still, at, you know, won 10 games a year for years. He just could never win the big one. And uh, that, that was something special. Now looking back so many years on it, uh, I even listened to that speech on, in, the, in the locker room. It was uh, It's pretty fun to listen to. Dude, that's, that's awesome, the – you're talking about him basically predicting what was going to happen and then it playing out and what it meant to get that win, you know, and it, it had to be crazy, you know, going from the class B state championship game to a couple of years later, you're playing in the national title game, playing against Warren Sapp, getting thrown in the mix. So that had to be kind of crazy. And it's funny you talking about getting up and thinking, Oh, that's going to look, you know, not so great on film, dude. That's every first players, uh, football players first thought after a play that they know didn't go well. Like, oh crap, I gotta watch that on film in front of everybody and get yeah. ripped into by the coach. Yep. But, uh, the eye so, in the, the sky, the eye in the sky don't lie, man. Yeah, and it don't go away either. That's for that's for <laughs> <Nope>. sure. <laughs> so okay, that actually leads into the next question I have written down here because your first full year of starting was 1995, and there were a lot of questions about that 95 O line. Okay, Aaron Graham came back as the center, but there were four new starters across the board. Now, you guys went out and just destroyed everybody. Okay, so you, had, you guys proved that there was no problem with that transition from 1994 to 1995 as a team, as an O-line. What was it like dealing with some of those question marks as an O-line yourself, a first-year starter, going in to that 95 season? Well, I think we were so young. I mean, I was a junior. Um, Eric Anderson and uh, little John Zadiska um, was part of it. Um, we were just, you know, we were backups. And uh, so, you know, we knew we had the legacy of the, not the legacy, but the tradition of the offensive line, the pipeline the year before that we had to, to not let down. Um, and I think going into our first game, we played Thursday night against Oki State. And, uh and, and we really didn't talk about it much, I guess, but I think all of us had it in our minds, like, okay, we can't let these guys down, you know, the ones that paved the road. And, um, it, it, you know, I, none of us really sat down, all, all five of us, you know, and said, hey, you know, we got to keep this thing rolling or anything. But in our head, we just knew there was a lot of pressure on us that we that we put on it by ourselves. And um, Coach Denniper did a really good job of keeping us even level-headed about it. Um 
And so after the first Okie State game, when we when we all played as one unit, I, I think that's when we all opened up each other's eyes and we're like, okay, we got this. We we can run through people if we want to. Um, and, you know, we were going against some pretty good dogs on defense on our own team, you know, with Christian and Jason and Grant and Jared. I mean, our defense was pretty salty. And so going against them and able to move the ball on them and practice and, you know, and, and blast through some holes there. And I think at the time, I think our third string quarterback was Amon Green, who's a Hall of Famer. I mean, that, that's that's the kind of stuff we were working with. So it wasn't like we didn't have talent in the backfield. It was, you know, it was up front. And we had to make sure that we could uh, just open a little teeny hole and let those guys blast through it. And um, and so after that Okie State game, I, I think we all realized at that point, okay, we, we got something good here. And, uh, there were some things that, 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 that team 94, they were probably a lot stronger than us, like stronger, like weight room strong. But I think we had a little more, we were smaller and more agile, a little more, athlete, you know, not athletic. I can't say athletic because they were very athletic, but we were just quicker to get on to linebackers and stuff like that. And I think that helped, helped us with, with our running game in 95. I am joined today on the Aloe Fiber VIP line by Nebraska Football Hall of Famer, two-time national champ, Chris Dishman. Now, Rico did just send me a message per our question a minute ago with Baylor's current athletic director, Mac Rhodes. Now, he that basketball scandal that you were referring to was from 2012 to 2016. Is kind of when it spanned, it took place. He got there in 2016, so he didn't really – he wasn't really there during that time – but he had yeah, to he had deal. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He had to deal with yeah. it going public. So while that's not a great thing, yeah, for him or Baylor, he does have that experience. If something were to happen like that, hopefully it never does. You know, if, if he were yeah. to come here or there again in Baylor. So, well, well, um, you know, yeah. So, yeah, I man, he would be a guy that knows that's been through it. So that'd be a good one to go because we might have something with our girls' basketball team, like the Red, too. So we don't know if that, how that's going to play out. That's very true. That's very true. So the next question I have here, and I have asked Rob Zadiska this, and I've asked a couple other players as well, but Rob's the one who brought it up on his podcast, oh, like two, three years ago. And he claims that the 1994 Huskers would beat the 1995 Huskers because the 1995 Huskers are the 1995 horse Huskers backups. Who do you think would win, 94 or 95? We would run through them. We would run through them. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> just, just line them up. <laughs> that's uh, that's the best answer I've gotten. Everybody else is so nice. I love you. We're just going to run through them. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll beat them like a drum. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. So another question yeah. I have here, and, and I don't hear many people ask about the 96 team. Obviously, you know, the tough game versus Arizona State, the tough game yeah. versus Texas. Still, top five team in the country, destroyed Vatek in the Orange Bowl. 10 wins that year. Very good season. My question for you, and I'm going to phrase it this way, just looking from a talent perspective, because I was a 12-year-old kid going into that season, and I remember Nebraska preseason number one, and I remember some analysts saying this may be the best Nebraska team, the most talented Nebraska team through that three-year span, 94, 95, 96. So my question, and the way I'm going to phrase it to you, okay, which team had the most talent? 94, 95, or 96, and that's not disrespectful to whoever you don't mention, but just as far as pure talent, who do you think was the most talented team out of those three years? I, oh, man. I would say 95 um, would have to be the most talented one because, you know, we had we had Lawrence, we had Tommy. Um, you can't. Those two are game, game changers in the backfield, and that's not taking anything away from Amon or Scott um, back there, but uh, uh, Tommy Frazier in his fourth year compared to a Scott, you know, Frost in his first year trying to take over a team is, is I would take Tommy in his fourth year any day of the week. You know, just, I, I mean, Tommy was so, so good and so dialed in that, that senior year. So um, that that's the reason I would say 95. Um, other than that, I think, um, yeah, we just, you know, we dropped the ball, and it, it sucked as a player. You know, you felt like you let the whole state down. I was a team captain on that team. Um, it was a, it was a very, very 
hard year once we lost to Arizona State. Um, we were, you know, I always say we were one we were one play away from winning that game, and what I mean is we weren't able to to, to create an explosive play, and we were one of those teams that ran on momentum, and we always knew that that one explosive play was just going to open the floodgates. Well, when that play didn't happen. Um, and it just everything the cards the, the the cards just fell and uh, and we end up losing and yeah Arizona State was in a national championship game at the end of the year people don't realize that they were a really good team but it didn't matter I mean we lost nineteen to nothing we were we put the big goose egg up on a team you know us that were used to scoring sixty or fifty points we we didn't score and uh, that, that that was humbling that was that that was hard and. Uh, the humbling, especially to just not get something going offensively for us. You know, our defense was good enough. If they can hold the team to 19 points, we should win every game we're on the field. Um, well, that's how we felt, and in that game, we didn't pull through as an offense. Yeah, to Chris's point, for those who may not remember, Arizona State that year, they had Jake the Snake Plummer at quarterback. They had Pat Tillman on defense, okay? And then they went undefeated, won the Pac-10 championship at the time. They were number two in the country, played Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, lost on an epic last play throw by Joe Germain in the corner, allowed Ohio State to win on the at the very end of the game. But they still finished top four in the country. It was Florida, Florida State, Ohio State number three, and then Arizona State number four that year. Nebraska was right there. I do remember – BYU yeah. was somehow ranked ahead of you guys. And no disrespect to BYU, but you got to be kidding me. Okay, so last yeah. question I got for you. Interim athletic director, Dennis LeBlanc. All right, I know you've got a lot of experience with Dennis because every former Husker football player has a lot of experience yeah. with Dennis. What are your thoughts? I love Dennis, man. Dennis was a great guy. Um, me and him didn't see eye to eye when I was in college. And uh, he was always looking out for the best of us. And I was probably the hard-headed kid that thought he knew it all. But uh you know, as I went back over the years, I always made it a point to go see Dennis and Keith Zimmer because um, those are the guys that I remember the most, probably because they're the ones calling me the most. <laughs> Tell me to get to class and everything. So, but uh, I have so much respect for him. And uh, if that's the, 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 you know, that's the reason I like that him as an interim right now. And if they would extend it to him, I'd be happy for him to, if that's something that he would want to do, because he has definitely put his time in the university and shown every student athlete from all sports how he feels about the program. I mean, he, he, He's been there for 30 or 40 years, and every student athlete that walks through that door, he knows. And uh, he knows, you know, their grades and why they're there to get an education and, uh, and the, to represent Nebraska the way it needs to be represented. So I'm, I, I was ecstatic just to see. I, I totally forgot about, you know, not totally forgot about him, but when they said that he was going to be interim, I was like, man, that is a great guy to put in that role. He knows the, he knows the system. He knows, he knows Nebraska. He knows the tradition. For sure. Uh, I completely 100% agree. I put something out on social media as soon as I found out he was named the interim AD and one of my former Husker teammates responded with, love Dennis. I think he's still holding one of my scholarship checks back for me with like a couple of laughing emojis. So, All right, Chris, I want to thank you for joining me. Uh, until next time, my friend, I appreciate it.